We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazleton. Welcome to the show. Well, I'm trying my best to join the Green Thumb Club, doing what I can to learn the ins and outs of gardening. What I've discovered, though, is keeping my plants properly watered, well, it can be a real challenge. So, I've decided to install an automatic drip irrigation system. You'll see how simple it can be. Then I head to the Sunshine State to help turn a bare alcove into a built-in entertainment center. Stay with me, you'll be glad you did. You know, the longer I'm here, the more I enjoy my gardening. But I've got one problem when it comes to watering. I'm on the road a lot and sometimes several days can go by and these guys don't get any water. Also, I've got several different situations. Container plants back here, foundation plants over here, and flowering plants. So what I'm gonna do is install an automatic drip irrigation system. It'll water the plants even if I'm not home and take into account their individual requirements. As much as two-thirds of the water used in our homes is actually used outside taking care of our yard and plants. And drip irrigation can show as much as a 70% water savings over other methods. Also, studies have shown that plant material grows as much as 50% faster using drip irrigation. My drip irrigation system is going to start right here with this hose bib or faucet. Now, the first thing I want to do is screw on this check valve. It's designed to keep the irrigation water out here from flowing inside the house and contaminating my household water supply. Tightening this set screw will keep vibration, or maybe even the kids, from loosening the valve. The next thing I want to do is turn this single faucet right here into four using what's called a hose bib manifold. Now these are pressure reducers. In a lot of homes, water pressure can run 60, 80, some places even over 100 pounds per square inch. That's way too much pressure for a drip irrigation system. So what this device does is drop it down from household pressure uh, to something in the 20 to 25 pound range. In the area that I've decided to irrigate, there are several different kinds of plants with different water requirements. So I've set up three areas or zones, and each one of them is going to be served by one of these outlets. This fourth one over here will be for my garden hose. Now remember, in my case, I want the water to come on and turn off automatically. So the next step for me is to install, or in this case, just screw on an automatic valve. These electronic valves operate using very low voltage. They'll turn the water on and off for each zone when they're instructed to do so. Now this is the brain behind my automatic drip irrigation system. It's called a timer or controller. It's completely weatherproof, battery operated, and each of these automatic valves will plug into the bottom like this. And then the controller itself mounts on the front of one of the valves. Now I'm going to program this and it will tell each of these automatic valves which day of the week to turn on, which time of the day to come on, and how long to run. Well, I'm finished with the work on my water source. Now I need to set up a distribution system to get the water from the valves to where it's needed. That water highway, if you will, is half-inch polyethylene tubing. Here are a couple of tips for working with this tubing. Put it out in the sun a couple of hours before you start. That'll warm it up and make it more pliable. And two, invest in a pair of these cutters. One end of the tubing I connect to the automatic valves. In my case, since I have fairly deep mulch in my beds, I'm going to lay the tubing on top of the ground. So all I'll have to do is rake a path. Then use tubing stakes to anchor the run in place. Now when you reach the end of a run of tubing like this, you have to close or cap it off. There are a couple of ways to do that. One is to take a figure eight clip like this, 
slip it over the tubing, bend the tubing, and then slide the clip back up to keep it in position. Sort of like you'd bend a garden hose to stop the flow of water. Another way to end a run of tubing is with a cap like this. When winter weather comes, I can just unscrew the cover and drain the lines. This half-inch polyethylene tubing brings water into a general area, and this smaller quarter-inch tubing delivers it to individual plants or groups of plants. To attach the smaller tubing to the large, I first use a special punch to make a small hole. Then snap in a connector. Next, I slip on a piece of quarter-inch tubing and cut it to length. On the ends of the tubing go the emitters, small nozzles, if you will, that emit different amounts of water, anywhere from one to four gallons per hour, in a variety of patterns. Drip emitters, like this, are extremely efficient, delivering water directly to the base of the plant. Misters, sprays, and sprinklers are often mounted on higher stakes and distribute water in quarter circle, half circle, full circle, even rectangular patterns. Just one of these can water several plants at once. For my container plants here, I'm going to use something called soaker tubing. The water actually penetrates through the wall. Now, it's very easy to use. I start by putting a T in the end of the quarter inch tubing, like this. Place one end of the soaker tubing on one arm of the T. Lay the soaker tube around the base of the plant. Cut it to length, and then hook the end of the tube on the other arm of the T. Now for my hanging plants, I'm going to use this flexible mister. With this part of my irrigation system in place and ready to go to work, I can rake the mulch back over the tubing, making it invisible yet accessible. The tubing can also be buried. Usually a trench just a few inches deep is adequate. Since the line is not under pressure, freezing is usually not a concern. The simplest way to run tubing across grass is to make an angled cut through the turf using a flat garden spade. Then lever the sod upward to create a shallow groove. Set the tubing in the bottom of the cut and press the grass back into place. This is called a sidewalk tunneling tool. It's simply a plastic nozzle attached to a length of PVC pipe with a hose connected to the opposite end. The stream of water actually bores a hole under the sidewalk. Once I'm through, I use a pair of PVC pipe cutters to snip off the nozzle and the hose connector. The plastic pipe stays in place and acts as a conduit. I just push the irrigation tubing through it. Well, I'm up early this morning, but not as early as my automatic irrigation system. You know, it's good to know that even if I'm on the road or I want to sleep in late, these guys are not going to suffer because of it. Now, there's a sound you hate to hear a screwdriver bit just slipping in the head of a screw. But there are a couple of ways that you might be able to get those screws out easier than you think. This product called Screw Grab is a gritty material suspended in a gel. Just a drop on a damaged screw head can increase a screwdriver's gripping power by up to 400%. Now, if this doesn't work, you might try a screw extractor. First, drill a small hole in the head of the screw. Then insert the extractor and turn it counterclockwise. The more you turn it, the deeper the extractor bites into the screw. So if you've got a stripped out screw head, now you've got at least a couple of ways to get those troublesome screws out. Brockway of Windermere, Florida has asked for a little help with a built-in bookcase. I'm a fair house call.
Hi, Hi. good morning, Hi. Rita. Hi, Ron. Come on in. Oh, thanks. This looks like this must be the area yep, over here you were talking about. Yep, this is the entertainment center. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, as you can see right now, it looks fairly um, undone, unfinished. So I really wanted a nice entertainment center so everything could have a proper place for it. Okay. Rita's living room has an alcove that's the perfect place uh, for the kind of entertainment center she has in mind. Right. She so wants something that looks space. built in so and can house her TV, stereo, CDs, books, books uh, and of course... Frames, little tchotchkes, little ornaments. Well, that's not what TVs look like these days, is it? <laughs> now it's time to sit down and draw a rough sketch. The base section will have doors and drawers for lots of out-of-sight storage. On top, we'll build three cabinets with adjustable shelving. Finally, to give our project that built-in look. What we want to do is, is put this in place and then trim out, the way I see it, the edge of it right, right. here, all the way around, with molding. That would look great. So that it looks like it was it's built into the unit. To save time and money and a lot of work, we construct the base from stock kitchen cabinets purchased at the nearby Home Improvement Center. The cabinets are first clamped together, then secured with screws. On each end, we attach a filler strip to conceal the space between the cabinets and the wall. Now, the, okay. it's the same with the drill. The further you pull the trigger, the faster the blade goes. Before setting the base section in place, we cut holes in the back of the cabinets to give us access to the electrical outlets and TV cable jack in the wall. Boring holes through the sides of the cabinets will allow us to run wires wherever we need them. Next, we measure for the countertop. So all the way to the corner. Okay, 79 and 3 quarters. Okay, good. And now let's measure from the wall. 29 and a half. Transfer those measurements to a sheet of three-quarter inch plywood. Okay, we want our cut here to be at 21. Then it's time for Rita to confront the tool she's most uncomfortable using. Okay. okay. Have you ever used one of these before? No. Are I you haven't. concerned about using this? Song? A little bit. Are you? Yeah. Keep going. Okay. There you go. All right. There you go. Beautiful straight cut. Good. How was that? Not so bad. Not so scary. Rita's first cutting job results in a near perfect fit. A piece of 1x8 poplar, notched to fit around the corners, conceals the edge of the plywood. Push it all the way down and then just pull the trigger like that. Then it's time for a shot with a nail gun. Now, if we were building a wet bar or a built in sideboard, you know, we could stop right here. Oh, we'd have to put on a better countertop, maybe plastic laminate or even granite. But the point is, this is a great way to get a built-in run of base cabinets like this using off-the-shelf kitchen cabinets. You can see that these went together in a very short time and they cost us less than $300. But we're not stopping here. We're building an entertainment center. It's going to go all the way up. So now, let's move on to the next section. The upper portion of our entertainment center will be made in three sections. A center section for the TV, and two side sections for books, audio gear, and collectibles. Using the circular saw and a clamp-on straight edge as a guide, we cut the sides, bottoms, and tops from sheets of three-quarter inch birch veneer plywood. Now the upper section of our entertainment center is going to have adjustable shelves. They're going to be supported on pins just like these. And these pins are going to be set into a series of holes. Now, two things are really important here. These holes have to start at the same point, usually near the bottom, and they have to be spaced precisely the same distance apart. Now, here's how we've been drilling those holes so accurately. After measuring and drawing a baseline, I align and clamp a pre-drilled plastic template to the cabinet side. Using a self-centering drill bit, I then drill a series of holes about two-thirds of the way through the wood. The process is then repeated on all of the cabinet sides. The face of this cabinet grade plywood is smooth and clean, but like most plywood, the edges are rough and unfinished. To conceal them, I apply edge banding, a thin strip of wood with a heat activated adhesive backing. Once it's trimmed and sanded, it'll make these plywood panels look like solid wood. We're going to face the edges of our shelves with a solid piece of 1x2 lumber. This edging will make the shelves more rigid and will give them a thicker, more substantial appearance. Well, it's time for some assembly, and we're going to start with this end section right here. 
I have laid all the pieces out on the table. Now we're going to glue and nail these together. But to help us position these pieces for assembly and to make the unit stronger, you're going to be using these wooden biscuits or splines. The biscuits are set into slots cut with this machine called a plate joiner, which can be rented or purchased for as little as $100. Once the joiner has cut the slot, glue is applied and a biscuit or spline is inserted. With the biscuits in place, more glue is applied to the surface of the wood and the pieces are pressed okay, together. Just put, put them right in the slots. With the splines holding everything in the correct position, the two pieces are nailed. A lot of things that we've done so far, it was just a matter of watching once how it's done and then I can become a pro because that's all you need basically is you need to be shown how to do something and then once you have that information, that knowledge, then you can do it yourself. Here we go. We complete this same assembly process for all three upper yeah. cabinets and carry each one back into the house. Very nice job. Slowly. Good job. job. <laughs> After securing the cabinets together with screws, we cut trim strips and attach them to the front edge of the cabinets to conceal the joint. Now Rita gets a chance to try out the power miter saw as she cuts the molding or casing that will give the entire unit that built in look. Finally, it's time to okay. mount the cabinet doors, install the drawers, and set the shelves into position. Okay. Boy, let's let me take a look at this. This came out so nice. I know we did it, but I, I must say, it really turned out nicely. You know, what was the most satisfying thing for you on this project? I think seeing it all put together at the end, it's a, it's a little hard to imagine sometimes just seeing the different parts and pieces, but when it's all pulled together, you really, you really yeah. see what it is. And I got to tell you, this really changes the personality of the entire room. Remember back what it looked like with that oh, just yeah. hole here? It's horrible. And now uh, what it looks like. And it changed yes. your personality, too. It did. Yes, you have a tool personality now. And I still have all my fingers. You do. <laughs> Great job. Thanks. Well, you know, whenever you try to pour paint out of a can into a bucket, what a messy proposition it can be. Well, here are a couple of ways to pour more neatly. This is a plastic pouring spout. To use it, you just take off the lid of a paint can, drop this right inside. Then, when you pour, it's accurate, no drips, no mess. Now, this spout is actually a replacement lid for a one-gallon can. Just take off the standard lid, pop this one on, tap it in place, unscrew the cap, and pour. When you're finished, just screw the cap back on and you've got an airtight storage container. So, no need for this anymore when you've got one of these or one of these. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com where you'll find hundreds of how-to videos available 24-7.